or my opinion, and I believe it's a sad reality, probably eight out of ten of those guys may not even have been saved to begin with. I mean, one of the most, one of the most popular Bible commentaries that people read, and the, and the guy, now, there's some good historical stuff. They have some historical value, you know, facts, and not, but when it comes to their theology and their beliefs, is a man named Barnes. Now, I've read a lot of the stuff that he said, historical, but you read over about the story of David and Goliath, and you know what that rascal said? He said, that was made up. He said, that's Jewish, that was Jewish uh, lure or fables to create a patriotic fervor. And so he said, I believe that. I, I believe the story of David and Goliath happened exactly like it was. I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what slips into a person's mind to think that they can look at the Bible and say, well, that's just made up. You know what I mean? Because if, if one portion is made up, then it's, why don't we just say it's all made up? You know what I mean? If we don't have authority. So no matter how intellectual or smart someone is, they, they shouldn't take, if they're saved, they shouldn't cast doubt on the Scripture. This is our foundation. This is our, our hope. But anyway, uh, let's look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you would, first of all here. And, and uh, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to be any longer than we need to be, but I think if you'll follow along in the scriptures, uh, I, first, I don't ever think the Bible's boring. So I think if you follow along in the Bible, I think it'll be interesting. This morning, I, I thoroughly, I mean, I, I love that story. I mean, what an incredible story of Joseph of Arimathea and how God laid that out for us and and uh, to me, that's exciting, man. I love Bible preaching. And, 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 uh, but this, this here, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, first of all, and uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think that in this chapter, if once you realize what this chapter is about, you wouldn't think that there was an Easter message in here, but there is. And uh, let, let's look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It, it sounds a little bit like it's going to be one of my normal holiday sermons, you know. Mother's Day message on hell, but uh, th this is this is my Easter sermon on fornication and incest. But First Corinthians chapter five, verse number one says, "It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as is named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife." So here we're starting out talking about an incestuous relationship in the church. And uh, by the way, this man uh, later was disciplined and later on brought back into the, into the assembly. And uh, so the Bible says, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already. Paul said, I wasn't even there, but I don't have to be there. And what he's saying is it doesn't matter how good a fella he is or how good a guy he is. or People say, well, if you understood the situation, Paul said, I've already judged it. And he, he judged it by the word of God. We have a crowd today, you're not even supposed to judge anything. But Paul said, I wasn't even there and I've already judged this. He said, y'all are puffed up about it. He said, for I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present. Concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, and my, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's pretty plain. The Bible says now, verse 6 says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Amen. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Before we read any further, I'll just say this, and we're going to go back and look at leaven in the Bible and talk about that for a minute because it goes along with the Passover. But if an adherent or a Bible-believing or a God-fearing Jew... When it came down to this idea of leaven, now, first of all, it was one of the first things that the Jews forsook was the idea of not having leaven. 
But God told him, he said, I want you to have a feast and there is to be no leaven. Not just in your f food, but in your household. Anywhere. So they would literally go out and they would search the whole house. I mean, they would look over in the cracks and the corners and they would look everywhere. And if they found any leaven, they'd throw it out. And they'd make a big deal out of it. Someone would say, I found some! And they would take it and throw it out. I mean, it was a big deal. They wanted to make sure that they had searched thoroughly and there was no leaven because it, was, it would be an abominable thing. And so here... It's not just a little leaven we're talking about, but we're talking about an, a, a, a wicked, unthinkable situation where a man takes his father's wife and fornicates. And so the Bible says that, he said, verse number seven, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. So he's saying, he's saying you are, notice, notice that, notice that how that's written. It says, purge out therefore, uh, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump. Now notice this, as you are unleavened. What he's saying is, if you're saved, there is no leaven. It's all, it's out as far as Christ is concerned, as far as your salvation is concerned, Christ removed all the leaven. He saved you. But he's saying live up to that standard. He's saying in, in your flesh, live up to that model of having no leaven. So he said for even Christ, look at verse 7, for even Christ our what? Passover is what? Sacrificed for us. For even Christ, now look at, now look at the verse number 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Beautiful verse. Here's what, he's, what the Bible is saying. It says, again, look at it. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. Obviously, we know what that means. That's talking about the old nature, the old way of of operation, sins that we should have already forsaken and left behind. You, you say, you mean God wants me to forsake my old sins not to get saved? You can't do that. Because you, you're not the Passover. You can forsake all the sins you want to forsake and still die and go to hell. You can repent all day long and still die and go to hell. You have to have a Passover. There has to be a lamb. You're not, you're, and we'll look at it here in just a minute. You're not saved because you repent. Now, repentance is in the Bible, but repentance is not salvation. There has to be a lamb. You can be sorry for your sin and not have a lamb and still pay the penalty. You can regret it. You can hate it. I mean, you can curse the day you were born and not have a lamb. So he's saying to, uh, therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, Neither with, now this is interesting, the leaven of malice and wickedness. You know what those two things are? Those are the sins of a pharisaical type of Christian. Malice, that's the kind of person that doesn't do wrong only because they're afraid of the repercussion and they're proud and they kind of hate other people because they do stuff and so they have malice toward them and uh, they're really, they're, they're, it's, they're inflated or pharisaical. It's, I'm pointing the finger at somebody else all the time. Boy, look what he does. Or, and look how that one lives. A, the, a malice person is a person that's more concerned with somebody else's Christianity than they are their own. Now, we're supposed to judge and we're supposed to preach and we're supposed to teach. But this guy, this guy here with this malice, he, he, would, rather, he would rather see someone sin so he could report on their sin than to see them live right so he can rejoice in the fact that they're doing right. You ever met a child like that before? Not, not that I, I don't want to say, Kurt, don't go to sleep. I'm preaching about you right now. I mean... Daddy, you wouldn't believe what they're doing in there. I mean, it's like they can't wait to you know, bring, bring bad tidings and, and just hope that they can bring down thunder and lightning from dad because they caught one of their siblings doing something they shouldn't be doing. Well, there's a lot of Christians that are like that. God calls that malice, not you, Kurt. 
and wickedness. It's wicked of me to want you to do wrong just so I can go to God or act like your sin makes me a better Christian. Or me reporting on you. So he says, not with that. He said, that's a different kind of leaven. That's malice and wickedness. Malice is ill will toward another brother in Christ, wishing them to do evil. We ought to, we ought to, we ought to not glory in each other's failures. But there are, man, there are preachers and there are people there. I've seen this all throughout. Christ. Boy, did you hear what old so-and-so did? I knew it was going to happen. I mean, we ought to be brokenhearted. Paul said, I'm grieved by what's going on. I mean, we, we ought not to be glad for it. Now, look what it says. We'll move on. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of what? Sincerity and truth. Now, the sincerity part just means without wax. It means for real. The truth part, I like, because I wrestle with the sincerity. I want to be sincere, but I don't have to wrestle with the truth because I have the truth. Amen? The, the more you read and study the Word of God, which is the truth, the less you have to worry about the sincerity. God's Word will make you a true Christian. Read the Word of God, study the Word of God. You won't have to wonder about whether or not you're sincere or not. The, the Bible gets, it accomplishes the job, and it'll drive out this malice. It'll drive out the wickedness. The Word of God will drive out the old nature. The Word of God, the Bible says we're sanctified by the Word. Amen? That's what the Word of God will do. It'll purify. It's true to work. And so as we read and study it, now verse number 9 says, And I wrote unto you in, the, in an epistle not to company... With fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. But I have written now unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. I knew a fellow once, and uh, knew him well. And uh, man, he and I remember him telling me he he was uh, married and he was talking about one of his in laws and he said, boy, he said we he said I'm not going to their house. He said but they want to go. He said, but that guy he's a fornicator. I'm not going to eat with him. Well, he that's he's right, but it also says not to eat with railers too. And this this fellow was a railer. And. Uh, he, he probably, the truth is, he's a little bit covetous. And the truth of the matter is, that's any of us are subject to be that way. So he's not saying here, just pick out one sin and say, okay, as long as you don't do that, you're okay. He's saying, let's get rid of all the leaven. He's talking about the Christian life living up to the standard of Christ as our example. Because in Christ, in order for him to be the Passover lamb, there had, he had to be without spot or blemish. There, had, there couldn't be any, in order to keep the Passover feast, there couldn't be any leaven. And so as, as Christians, the aim or the objective is to get rid of the leaven. The aim and the objective as Christian is not to be better than so-and-so or to be a, as good a Christian as somebody else or to say, well, I don't do what they do. Oh, John, I'll tell you what. That fella, I think, oh, B.R. Lakin was preaching somewhere and the preacher said, uh, where were you at last week? And he told him, he said, does that fella still smoke? And B.R. Lakin said, I don't know. Do you still lie? <laughs> and it's amazing. I mean, I've known for years, you know, uh, Old free will Baptist, God bless them. I mean, that, you know, they you can lose your salvation for everything but chewing tobacco because they all chew. So, it, but you can you can you can lose it for smoking. You know, you, it's in question, but you can chew it and you're okay. I mean, I'm just telling you that you, everybody creates this standard that if you do this and this, it's a, but this is a really bad sin. But God said, purge out how much of the leaven, all of it. Well, based on that, we understand. That in this flesh, we're going to be dealing with that until we get to heaven. So nobody has any room to glory. Nobody has any room for malice to say, well, you know, we'd have a great church if it wasn't for all the sinners there. 
I remember a fellow one time stood up in church and testified and we were going to another church and dad was in the service and this fellow, he might have been, I don't know, he might have been a little drunk at the time. He just came in the service in the back and he stood up and he said, whatever happened to the days when sinners used to come to church? And everybody looked around and said, yeah, what, you know, they're looking around at each other saying, yeah, what happened to those days? And my dad was there and he said, buddy, what do you think's here tonight? He said, every one of us is sinners apart from God's grace. We all deserve to go to hell. Even the preacher looked at that afterwards, so I hadn't thought about that yet. But we don't think of ourselves as that way. Because we compare ourselves among ourselves. Well, I'm as good as so-and-so, and God says they that do that are not wise. The opposite of wise is a fool. But God calls it having malice or wickedness. God says, I want you to purge out all the leaven. He said, we're going to have a feast. It's going to be a Passover feast. He said, we're celebrating the Passover. We're celebrating the, 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 the lamb that was slain and the Passover. And we're going to have this feast. And now we know that in the Old Testament, they took a lamb. It was just an old animal. But, but they still had to inspect it. It had to be a male lamb. And we're going to look at that passage in a minute. And it had to be a lamb without blemish. And it had to be approved. And everything had to be, the blood had to be applied. But we know we have a lamb that is without spot and blemish. When we get saved, the blood is applied. Let's finish this chapter in chapter 8. But now I've written to you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And Paul, what Paul's doing there in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is he's turning the heat up and he's reminding that church there was plenty of, I promise you, there was a plenty of covetous people. It's easy to covet. God says, thou shalt not covet, right? There's a, it's, easy to, it's easy to rail on people. Now, now take your Bible and turn with me. Uh, to the book of uh, Exodus, chapter number 12. Turn there just for a minute. The only way I can know to keep you, I got it, if you'll keep reading here and stay with it, and uh, we'll, we'll see here. Exodus, chapter number 12. All right, Exodus chapter 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, Now notice this is talking about the Passover. In this month shall be unto you the what? Beginning. The beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So what he's saying is we're starting here. Everything starts here. Christianity starts, your salvation starts with the Passover, with Christ the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. People say, well, in order to be saved, you've got to make him the Lord of your life. You, you're not saved because Jesus is Lord. You're saved because he's the lamb. You know, you can be a disciple and still not be saved. You say, well, no, that doesn't make sense. What, what was Judas? A disciple means a learner. You know, there's lots of people that learn and study the Bible and know a lot of facts about the Bible but they've never, they don't have the lamb. Look, yeah, he's Lord whether you realize it or not. Amen. Now look what it says. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now look at this, verse number three. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Notice those, notice those two words, a lamb. If you'll pay attention, I want to show you something. Notice those two words, a lamb. And if the household be too little for the lamb. You see that? First of all, you saw a lamb. Then you see what? The lamb. Now follow on. 
Let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So he says, if, if the, the household next door to you, if you want to share with them, you can. Amen. First of all, he said, speak to the congregation. He didn't say, do it to yell at them. He just said, tell, let them know that this is the way it's going to be. These, these are the rules. You know, as Christians, I don't have to jump up here in the pulpit and say, hey, you're all going to go to hell. Now, the truth of the matter is, I can just simply say to you, without Jesus, you're going to go to hell. I've heard some fellas preach on hell, and everybody will holler, amen, pray, you know, and it's like they want everybody to go to hell. I mean, it's like they're wanting to take people there personally. You know, as Christians, we ought not want people to go to hell. We ought not be glad about it. He said, speak to them. Now, notice this. He said, if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next in his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Now, notice verse number five. What's it say? Your lamb. First of all, it said a lamb. Then it said the lamb. Now it says your lamb. To a lot of people, people say, who's the Passover? What's Easter all about? Well, I guess about Jesus. Well, who is he? Well, he's the lamb of God. Okay. But is he your lamb? It's one thing to know that he is the lamb but something else to know that he's your lamb. Now look what it says. Your lamb shall be what? Without blemish. Did you, you, didn't, you weren't the one that decided that. They, it, had to be, it had to be decided. Now in the, the, later on, the high priest, that would, he would take a lamb and they would put it up for three days and inspect it and it had to be without blemish. The Bible says, a male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Do you know that's exactly, by the way, what happened? The, is the congregation of Israel said, crucify him. You know, they didn't even realize that they were crucifying their lamb. They didn't even realize it. The Bible says in verse number 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh. Now notice this. Remember Jesus told him, he said, Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. you you got to understand, and this is a, you, you, you're saved by the blood, but the Christian life is not just saying, Oh, okay, I'm saved now. They, that's what they say about us when we teach eternal security. They'll say, oh, if I believe that, I just live any way I want to. But a person that says that doesn't really understand what salvation is. Because salvation is trusting Christ as your Savior, as your Lamb, but it's also partaking of Him. It's, it's eating His flesh and His blood. That means He becomes a part of you. It's a feast. That's what Paul was saying to them. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians in a minute. He was saying about their feast, about having a continual feast. It's every day. The Christian life is daily. Every day we don't get to take off and put it aside and say, well, I mean, you know, does it count now? No, we're supposed to be Christians all the time. That's what he's talking about. Not because a fellow says, well, I want to sin and fornicate, so I'll just act like I'm not one. No, you still are. You're just sinning against God. You're, you're in error. So he said... And they shall eat the flesh in that night and roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast it with fire. People wonder, well, where was Jesus at? What was he? he the, the Bible says that it was to be a burnt sacrifice. I, I, believe, he, I believe he tasted hell for us. I believe he, his soul was dipped in hell Bodily, he experienced the fire that you and I would have to experience. I know that he was there the whole time. I don't know the time period. I just know that the Bible says here, speaking of this, that they were sodden it all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with his pertinence thereof. 
and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it into the morning ye shall burn with fire. Now verse 11 says, And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Amen. You say, this is a big deal. He said, I want you to eat it. He said, and, and I understand that you're, you're in a hurry. He said, and you, but you might have to go. He said, but you can't go until you eat it. You've got to take care of the main thing. You've got to take care of the Passover. There's a lot of people that think they can be, religion says, well, if you do this and this and this, you know, and, and uh, uh, if you match up to our code, then you're safe. But he's saying you can't do anything until you take care of the Passover. You don't, you can't, he said, eat, your, eat with your shoes on, he said, but you've got to make sure that this thing is taken care of, and if you don't eat it all, then you've got to burn it. Can't, you can't, you can't not take care of the lamb. You have to, you have to, before you can run the Christian life, you have to know Christ, amen? So he said, and yet shall let nothing of it remain till the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12 says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt with man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. There's what we said just a minute ago. He's the Lord. So I don't think that was very fair. God never asked if it's fair or not. People say, well, I think old so-and-so is a pretty good fella. I bet they made it to heaven. No matter how good you are. There's none righteous, no, not one. You have to have the lamb. The, 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 the somebody will come along and say, well... I don't think you get to choose. I think God chooses you. I think there are just some people ordained to salvation and some people ordained to hell, and it's not your choice. Now, there's a lot of people that teach that, and they preach that, and they have a name for that, that error. But can I tell you something? Moses didn't say to them, now, I'm going to come and kill a lamb, and I'm going to put the lamb over the doorpost on the two lentils, and you don't have a choice in the matter. They had a choice. Christ, you have a choice whether or not you accept Christ. No, no one's going to make you get saved. You have to choose Christ. You have to accept him. You have to apply the blood. And the blood shall be to you, in verse number 13, and the blood. See that, verse 13? And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the what? When I see your good works, when I see your church membership, when I see your good intentions, when I see the blood, without shedding of blood, there is what? No remission of sin. When I see the blood, I will do what? Does it say I might pass over? I'll think about it. I'll come down and see how good a people you are. When I see the blood, that's it. Doesn't matter who's inside that house, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now let me just say this. All the other feasts the children of Israel would have, they all took place when they left Egypt. But you don't leave Egypt to get the Passover. You don't, people say, oh, I'm going to get saved. I'm going to get my life straightened up. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You, you, don't, get, you don't get out of Egypt and then get saved. You get, everybody gets saved in Egypt and then you get out of Egypt. Amen. Amen? Right. Honestly, it's so dumb. People, uh, people want to, uh, they, 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 they they want to, they play right in the devil's hands. They want to get everybody cleaned up first and then get them saved. It doesn't work that way. You don't, you don't get, that's what religion does. We're going to get you out of Egypt and then we'll tell you about Jesus. No. If you repent and bring forth fruits, meet for repentance and prove that you mean it, 
and show us that you're out. You give up all your sin, then we'll talk to you about Jesus. <coughs> Wrong. The Passover feast, the Passover took place in Egypt. Everybody gets saved. If you get saved, you got to get saved in your sin. And then afterwards, we'll, we'll move, we'll get out of Egypt afterwards. But even though they got out of Egypt, did all of Egypt get out of them? Never did. Never did. And it won't for us until we go to heaven. We're always going to be dealing with it. But how many of them came out of Egypt? All of them did. Amen. All of them that lived through this Passover here. The Bible says here, now it goes on. It says, and this blood shall be to you for a token upon the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now here's the feast. He said, now that you're, he said, I don't ever want you to forget this time. Can I tell you something that as Christians we're never supposed to forget about him saving us? Don't ever get over your salvation. Don't ever get over the blood. Why do you think, why do you think we sing so, so many songs? There is a fountain filled with blood. Draw from Manuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. That's why we're supposed to talk about the blood of Jesus and sing about the blood of Jesus. Can you imagine... These churches and places where they take the blood out of their song books, they don't want to talk about the blood. Can you imagine a preacher saying, well, the blood's not what saves you? No, without the shedding of blood, is no remission of sin. He said, I want you to remember this. They'll say, oh, that's a bloody religion. No, uh, it, no don't, don't, be, don't, don't be upset when they say that. It is a bloody faith, amen? God's blood, Christ died on Calvary the perfect, sinless Son of God, and without that blood shed, there is no salvation. So how do you know if you're saved or not? Is the blood applied? No. It's not how good you are. It's not how you feel. It's the blood of the Lamb. Amen? The old preachers used to preach this all the time, and we hardly ever hear about it much anymore, but we got to have the blood. Look what he says. Now, he says, now afterwards, he said, this ordinance is to be forever. Seven days, verse 15, shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be what? Cut off from Israel. What was he talking about? The same thing as what we read about in 1 Corinthians Wait a minute, you said that's New Testament, that's, that's, that's the gospel aid dispensation. When they said cut off from Israel, that's not talking about, he's saying you separate them from among you. He said you sep put them outside the camp until they repent, until they get right. That's what being cut off was talking about. He said they would be cut off from Israel and the first day there shall be an holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them. Save that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day and in your generations by an ordinance forever in the first month on the 14th day of the month at even you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and 20th day of the month at even seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses for whosoever eateth that which is leavened even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of israel whether he be a stranger or born in the land you know what that's saying that's saying that uh, if a stranger wants to partake of this, they can be saved also. Amen? And so he said, though, but the, the, the same rule applies. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. 
and you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood is in the ba- the blood in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into you into your houses to smite you. By the way, the destroyer is sin. The Bible says the sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. But we ought, to, we ought to have the right attitude about sin. Sin and leaven represent the same thing here. And, and the, talk, the idea, he said, I want you to get rid of it. And he says in verse 24, And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when you be come into the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised that ye shall keep this service. Look at verse 26. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? You see, they weren't there. But he said, Then ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the house of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our house, our houses, and the people bowed the head and did what? And worship. Why? Because it was a reverential, reverential thing. They were, they were acknowledging the fact that God had saved them. We ought not to be afraid of that word saved. We ought to... And people say, how do you know for sure you're saved? Well, the blood's been applied. I know the Lamb of God. Jesus is my Lamb. My, the blood's been applied. Now, verse 28, And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. If you continue reading, you'll find in the remainder of this, ver- this chapter, you'll find that the death angel did pass over that night. And every house where the blood had not been applied, the firstborn died. Death visited. You know what the Bible says, and we're going to read it, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You know, the law couldn't save anybody. All the law did was condemn. There had to be a lamb. In the Old Testament, when they would offer that yearly sacrifice of the lamb, all that lamb would do was take care of the sin for the past year. They had to keep doing it every year. And the high priest would take the lamb into the Holy of Holies, and no one could go in there but the high priest. That's why they actually had a string tied around his ankle and had bells on the bottoms of his gown that he walked, and they would listen, and if they didn't hear the bells, they would tug on that string to make sure he was still alive. And if they didn't get a response from him, they would drag him out. Because if you went in there to get him, you'd die. That's the Holy of Holies. Jesus was our priest. And he took himself into the Holy of Holies. The Bible says the veil was rent in twain. So now that it's not just the high priest that can go in there, but we, you and I can go in there now. It's a big deal. Amen? But he says, but he says in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ is our Passover. And he uses that to illustrate why Christians need to purge out the old leaven. Because we're to have a continual feast with Christ. It's a daily thing. It's not just, it's not just once a year. It's not just every once in a while. But we're to wake up every single day mindful of the fact that we're not supposed to have leaven in our life. We're supposed to be pure and clean and right before God because Christ is our, is our Passover. And that's, that's, that's the analogy that the Apostle Paul referenced in correcting the New Testament church at Corinth when it came to their sinful behavior. He went all the way back to the book of Exodus. I don't understand this modern Christianity that wants to disassociate from the Old Testament. We, I don't have a problem with the fact that Easter time is the Passover. We're remembering our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
In Acts chapter number 12, just real quick, I'll just show it to you, and we'll, we'll be done. But the one time the word Easter is used in the Bible, and now I'll, I'll open, I'll read to you here what someone said about it. Acts chapter number 12. Again, the word here says, Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king, the Bible says, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now there's the word, that's the one time you're going to find the word Easter in the Bible. And uh, in, in that reference, I'll read just to you one comment, one fellow, he said here uh, on that use of the word Easter. He said this, this and I quote, there never was a more absurd or unhappy translation than this. That's the, that's the, people, and people will say, what commentary do you study? What, well, I'm just telling you, here's what the commentary said. The original is simply after the Passover. The word Easter now denotes the festival observed by many Christian churches in honor of the resurrection of the Savior, but the original has no reference to that. Nor is there the slightest evidence that any such festival was observed at that time when this book was written. And it goes on to try to say that the word Easter is of Saxon origin and that it's a satanic word. The same people that will say that are the same people that will say Monday, Tuesday. When every, one of those, every one of those days all come from the lunar calendar from, and, and are, denote false gods and paganism. But they want to jump on the word... Easter. Oh, you can't say that. Hey, you're talking about Estrus. You're talking about the goddess of fertility. And the word Easter is translated the word Pascha or Paschal, which was the lamb. So all we're talking about when we're talking about Easter as Christians, it doesn't matter what somebody else came along and created the word that was similar to that. And so we want to tie the words together and say, oh, you can't say that. Hey. And, and we get weird like that. It's Resurrection Sunday. Whatever well, Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Amen. But this is, this is we celebrate and remember the Passover. Amen? I don't know. If that's, I mean, that just it irritates me sometimes. We, we let the world dictate our words. And every one of these people get that. And when they say that, when they, when they say that, you know, they will refuse to say Easter. They don't realize that they're acknowledging the same crowd that's, that tears down the Bible and says the Bible's wrong for using that word. Yeah. The Bible's right, we're wrong. Yeah. Amen? And God said it was, it was Easter. Someone else didn't say that. God said that Passover time, God said it was Easter time. And that meant, that meant Pascha. That was the translation, the Paschal Lamb was Jesus and I don't even like using the word Paschal because it's not, but that's just what the word meant. And we just meant the Passover lamb. And that's who Christ is. He's our Passover. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. And thank you, God.